Hello, people. Thank you for coming. I'm Zygmunt. This is Neil. Hello. And we're going to talk about Fedora and Snaps, obviously. So, so we're both of us going to talk. We haven't rehearsed, so this is not going to work very well. So I'm just going to let Neil talk until I interrupt him. Okay. So go ahead. So, uh, wow. <laughs> so uh, my name is Neil. Uh, that is Zygmunt over there. Um, Many of you know me because I've been involved in the Fedora community for almost a little over a decade now. I'm a Fedora, I'm a Fedora packager, contributor. I'm also involved in Magia, OpenSUSE, OpenMandriva. Occasionally you will see my name show up randomly in Debian things, hopefully not too often, but uh, it shows up every once in a while. Um, I'm a contributor to RPM, DNF, Open Build Service, Koji, Zipper, the work, all the related projects in that particular space. Um, and I guess for completeness, I professionally am a DevOps engineer at Datto Incorporated, uh, and my Twitter email address, if you want to email me, and gump at fedoraproject.org. Um, Zygmunt? Yeah, so I'm with Canonical. I've been at various places before, but essentially here I'm representing the Snapcraft project. Uh, and I'm working on Snappy since 2016. And uh, yeah, so there's been a lot of stuff you can Google about me, but that's, not, that's interesting, I think. Uh, I think that's it. So, just because Zygmunt keeps forgetting this, he's technically officially the cross distro guy. And he's the guy who does all the confinement crap. And so he's, I get to bug him all the time when stuff doesn't work. It's a team effort. Uh, so, so, what are snaps? Um, so, this is some of the boilerplate stuff that. Uh, that he uses, that he pulled from the uh, website from Snapcraft.io, but it basically is, uh, you know, just squash a fest file system thingies that uh, contain all the code of your application and hopefully is minimally linked to other things, but can be connected to each other to provide something marginally useful, kind of like bundles of bundles. Um, hopefully, it's easy to use and easy to set up and easy to make. That's the hope, anyway. This is the technical view, yeah. This is, uh, you know, this is squash fast, read only, confined, you know, tries to be simple. But really, I think the point of a snaps is just to ship software. Like, raise your hand if you ship software on Linux yourself to users. Okay, not everyone's holding their hand up. If this was me talking to people in any other community, everyone would be holding their hand up because they can just do it. So we'd like to make that possible as well. So these are some of the popular snaps. Um, you'll notice, you know, to some audience that not all of them are actually free and open source software. But you know, they apparently they don't discriminate. So here you go. There's stuff that's good and nice and fun, and stuff that just makes you want to cry inside. And um, one thing that I think is really important to highlight is that we're trying to make people ship software not through intermediate people like distributions. We really want them to ship, to ship the software themselves. So. Not all of these are shipped by the upstream people. I think maybe Minecraft is not. And the rest is actually shipping directly from the people who make the software in the first place. So I think this is the thing I wanted to highlight. This is really trying to make a funnel to users from the people making the software in the first place. And we have, of course, you know, the, a big part of this is because it's about making the, de the development and the shipping of software easy and useful, there's obviously going to be integration with various development stacks, including you know weird IoT things like Robot OS and Moose and you know horrible things that make you want to cry when you look at how the code is actually organized and how you build stuff. Because we want to abstract away the crappy. Yeah. So this part is coming from the build part of Snaps, uh, which is not SnapD. It's a sister project at Snapcraft. But essentially, the idea is that people already are using the stuff that is natural for whatever their environment they're working with. Like Python has its own stack for you know doing stuff. So instead of like coming up with another you know way of doing things, people have to learn. We're just like essentially asking them to point us to the thing they're familiar and comfortable with in the first place. So the whole packaging experience is much easier. And one thing which is not clear from all of this is it's not another packaging format without a Bible we have to read, which is the policy that makes it work. There is nothing to read. This is essentially a Wild West free for all because of the changing the mechanism this works. So you don't have to adhere to a policy because, well, if you don't, nothing breaks. It's not that all of these live next to each other and have to be very nice and you know very gentle or they stop on each other's toes. It's much easier to package software. That's why we actually went through the effort to integrate to all of these things because you know 
if we integrate, but all these people still have to read a 100-page you know, manual to figure out how to package a Scribble program, they're not going to really do it. And they're not going to go through the exercise. And we wouldn't have the previous slide. So I think the point is that snaps are easier to package than normal software used to be because we changed kind of how they run. So we don't have to have all these rules. So this is kind of the, uh, the story for my part of this, you know, how it kind of started. The conversation, this is obviously a little bit of a dramatic reenactment. This is a little bit of a dramatic reenactment, but it was like I showed up in the Snappy RC channel after they were talk made their fanciful press release about how they wanted to make snaps like a cross distro thing. I was like, hey, do you want to help doing this? I saw, you know, you made this stuff, you made this package for Fedora and it's god awful and it doesn't actually work. Uh, would you like some help? And it's like, awesome, this guy is the guy who's working on it. And uh, uh, he says, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, help. And I was like, sure. And next thing I know, I'm getting a plane ticket uh, to go and meet him in person here in Germany. First time I've ever been to Germany is because of him. And, you know, we had fun and we figured out and that's how it kind of started. Um, and the ongoing work that, you know, Zygmunt and I have been working on have been mainly about getting the main SnapD releases actually a lot better, a lot faster. And also, like, we can actually catch things before they become release problems for Fedora. And that's always been a, you know, troublesome. And so, like, I wrote an SE Linux policy, one of my first complete policies, to be quite honest, and uh, started, yeah, I upstreamed it into the code base because it makes way more sense to have it part of that. And we just, you know, we test it against it, we keep improving it. Um, and we've started turning on integrations now that things are actually starting to work. We've started turning on integrations for desktop environments. So GNOME software was turned on, and then Plasma and Discover recently got switched on. And the big focus for Zygmunt and I has been mainly things that get weird because it expects Ubuntu. Um, we find them and kill them with fire. And so the whole process is actually, you know, if you don't hate Go with a passion, uh, it's actually kind of fun-ish. You know, come and take a look. And yes, actually, the cookies are quite good. <laughs> so where we are right now, since Fedora 26, we've actually had SnapD available. It actually was technically in the archive in Fedora 25, but it was in updates. But as of 26, it was part of the uh, GA. And we've also had it so that SnapD will actually activate correctly, depending on your environment. Um, since 27, we had it working correctly for cloud environments. So. Um, we have SnapD and GNOME software integration that was turned on in 26. Um, it's been improved over the last few releases, so now it actually um, will give you the ability to select channels and tracks, which are various aspects of testing different classes of the software. Either it's in testing or it's got a different feature or some kind of configuration difference. Um, and, you can, and it's basically like the same kind of experience you'd expect from, you know, if you want to install an application from, from the Fedora repos or other third-party repos that have AppStream data and stuff like that. The sum of the data is not quite there, but at least it'll all show up and you can actually pick them. Um, we have for Plasma Discover since Plasma 5.13, it finally works enough that I'm actually comfortable with switching it on, so I have. Plasma 5.13 has been backported to 28, so it is now available there too. Um, please give it a shot, start talking about it, start using it. File bugs against KDE because like they, uh, nobody has it on except for us right now. So we're like the guinea pigs for this. Uh, it kind of works, there's glitches, but I'd love to hear more about what's going on in there so that we can see and improve that. Um, the bad thing right now, we have no develop developer story for Fedora Snaps yet. That's something we're, we're like on working on. Uh, you want to say some bits about this? Yeah, there's going to be some nice stuff. Sh like the 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 point of this thing is to prepare you so you can see the nice stuff we come come up with later. Uh, so Snapcraft is the part that makes snaps buildable. Uh, with you know with like belts and suspenders, it's easier to build. You don't have to really understand the full thing. Uh, you can still build them manually, but people actually use Snapcraft because it's nice. But Snapcraft is like tied to the Ubuntu archive as a source for many things. So you have actually want to build something. The tool chain is coming from there. So you know it's 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 just one thing. Uh, and when we looked at making it possible to use, you know, the Fedora archive for that, well, it turned out to be extraordinarily difficult. Yes. So much so that I gave up twice. Uh, so the good thing is that Snapcraft itself has changed. Uh, it's changed because it's gotten way too complex to actually um, work reliably. So when people are on a specific configuration, things would work. But when people drift from that, that configuration, things would just stop working. So the the whole concept of Snapcraft works internally has been much simplified. So essentially, um, there is no deviation. Everyone would just build in a VM, which is appropriate for the, the for the snap they're trying to build. If the snap expects to be 
built in a Fedora environment, it's just going to build in a Fedora environment. It's just going to work fine. So it's actually possible to take, you know, take a Snapgrid file and hand it off to someone, and they're going to build it, and going to get a working package instead of something that doesn't work. Right. So that actually allows us to make the Fedora part of it possible because it's both easier to do internally in Snapcraft and because we have done something cool which we're going to come to soon. Yeah. Like Zygmunt did a nice lead on here. So like where we're going, well, damn. So there's supposed to be emoji there. There's a, there's a super nice emoji. It'll probably show up when I like export the slides and put it up for people to look at later. But just imagine like a smiling angel with a halo on top, you know. That that's what it's supposed to be. You know, whole the whole thing we've been working on since everything is now running you know, more or less okay. There's there's some ugly caveats with, you know, security confinement and stuff, but, you know, we're getting, we're working through those. The big thing that we're working on right now is making Fedora a first-class citizen. That means including people, making Fedora a preferential source for building snaps and shipping them. Because a lot of times what people want is the latest and greatest stacks. And today, as Fedora as it is, is actually an excellent source for all these things. And we want to make it the way people want to build software to release to people so that they get the first class software, they get the new stuff as it is available and it is stabilized and tested. And so the testing and integration for the base snap is actually happening during this development cycle. Um, the whole hope is that we will actually be able to get all the pieces in place to make it so that within the as part of release composes, we will be automatically updating and pushing these out. And then same to how we do for Docker images and eventually, hopefully, I think for Flatpak, they're doing something with the Fedora runtime stuff. We want to have the same kind of facilities in place for, uh, for snaps. And r the part after that, which is honestly, I think, probably going to be kind of the most difficult aspect and hopefully um, once we've got the base snap stuff done people will be interested in helping us because I would love to have so other people like working with us on this is getting Snapcraft to be first class in Fedora because I already have Snapcraft kind of packaged I can't ship it because it's basically broken but uh, we would love to make it so that Fedora support is first class and works so well that people will choose it over Ubuntu. So, uh, just to expand on one thing here so you may not uh, know that if, it, if you have an application snap, the developer of that snap actually chose the base it's going to run on top of, which is essentially the runtime, you know, the libraries, the, the data files that it chooses to use is per snap. So I may have a system running two applications from two developers. One of them is going to run on top of the Ubuntu runtime, while the other is going to run on top of the, the Fedora runtime, and they don't conflict in it with, with, with each other in any way. And it also doesn't mean that if I'm on Fedora, every application I have is running on the Fedora, uh, on the Fedora runtime, or has to, or has to be rebuilt. It's just the same binary running always on all the machines, but the developer gets to choose what they want to, like who essentially they want to trust more, or who has the most latest software available. And as you actually develop your application, you can freely switch this. Um, you know, on this release it was this thing, but I actually tested this other base. It's actually better, and I can switch. And for users, it's, there's no, you know, they don't actually, you know, get to do anything complicated. It's just a, an application update, and they're on another release using perhaps another base. So it's all smooth and integrated in a way that developers can have the tools they have, they want to have from the best source they feel comfortable with, and for the users, it just works. So, demo, demo time. time. Yeah, so this is going to be a live demo where I will show you some something pretty simple. So, you can try this on if you're on Fedora. Um, there are four steps. I'm just going to read it aloud so people can see what I'm doing later um, uh, mentally. For we're installing SnapD. It's not uh, installed by default. Um, then we ask SnapD to install the Fedora 29 base snap. I have to actually do it explicitly because we're not comfortable that to say this is stable. So I have to do it explicitly. Otherwise, just installing a snap that chooses to use some base would just pull in the base. And I'm going to install the Hello Fedora snap. And for all of these snaps, there are nice uh, Git URLs so you can see how they're made. They're super trivial to understand. You don't, they're, like, they're, they're essentially made with shell and make. And I run this snap using either snap run. If you haven't uh, installed snapd before, you will not have the path set up correctly. So snap run will run it, or just say Hello Fedora if you have before. So I'm going to type it now, and you're going to see what happens. And there is no Ubuntu in any of that. So I run a snap on Fedora without Ubuntu pieces being included. So that's the thing we managed to reach this cycle. Most importantly, while Zygmunt is running this, he's running this on a laptop running Fedora 28. Because there's no Ubuntu on his computer. I made sure that he made sure of that. So this is, this is live and in you know, all the right ways. 
Wow, you can't type. So, uh, I have a bunch of stats here. You know nobody can hear you right now. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> he, no, he's going to... Check, 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 okay. He's just going to hold it for you. Be nice to Florian. So the, the input command actually shows you the information about the snap. And um, it doesn't show you the base here, unfortunately. You know, it knows about the base, it just doesn't cho chooses not to show it. Um, but you can see that this is just a simple hello world application. There's some license, there's some metadata you would see in a store typically. It has some commands that it exports to the system, and there are some channels available. So you, actually, you can actually choose like the stability level of this the per application you want to install. So right now, I think I have installed version 1. Uh, sorry, actually I have 2.0. So uh, yeah, the practice of trying your demo before actually makes you leave the state at the end. But I'm just going to run it so you can see what happens. Well, that was like a non-event, right? It just ran. But there was no Ubuntu anywhere in involved in that whole thing. It was essentially creating a, not a truth, but like a container with the Fedora root file system based on Fedora Rawhide. It had the application, which is just a single f C file compiled to, to a single executable, essentially. In that space, it ran it, and that's what I had. How can you prove it? So, um, because people are like always when they're introduced to a new technology, they, they don't understand and you want to understand how it works by playing out in the environment. We have a way to run a shell within a within the environment of a given snap. So this is now the environment in which the Hello Fedora binary would execute. And actually, actually show you, you know, around what it is. And it's just raw height, but it's not Ubuntu. So this is a little bit hacked up version of raw height because I pushed the patch to master. Obviously doing this, I had to find a bug in SnapD, so this is just working around the bug. But this is just a Rawhide OS release file except for the little hack. And the whole root file system is essentially Rawhide. There are a bunch of things that are coming from my distribution, which is Fedora 28, like my home, uh, home directory and a couple of other things. But essentially, it is just this distribution that I chose to pick as my runtime. Um, and the application actually is mounted here. So this is where. This is where the entire application lives. And this is another file system. And actually, you can see that there are not that many things in here. It's not the full container with like, this is not like, you know, you, you, you get a doc con container with some application, and it's like a gigabyte, and you're not quite sure what's in it. This is just what actually you want to ship. So as little as possible, that makes your application work. Could be a single file, could be, you know, a huge Java runtime, which I have another example of, that, and some jar files, or whatever you want. It's just some container bundle you want to have that runs on top of the file system bundle you picked as the base snap. And actually, I can run just the Hello Fedora binary here to, show, you know, to prove that this works. You know, it's, it's not like interesting because it's obviously just <laughs> doing it. But again, it took us a while to get to the point where Ubuntu is not a strict dependency of the whole stack anymore. So um, one thing I also want to show you is that um, snaps have this fan fancy thing which we call channels. And I'm just going to quickly show you that I can switch per snap the version of application I want to have. You can also install them simultaneously, but, uh, well, I'll get to that. Oh, come on. So as I said before, and right now I have a version 2.0. It's at the very bottom. It says installed version 2.0. It's the revision switch to 1.0, which is in the stable channel. Right now I'm, I'm testing the candidate release, so I'm going to switch to stable to see how this works. So I asked Snappy to refer to the stable channel. And that's done. And now if I actually run it again, it, it says the same thing. But actually, that's the only application. It's just Hello Fedora. But if I go to the candidate channel, I have another application there, which is in the same snap, but there's another application. One day you'll get the hang of this typing thing. Yeah. And boom, there's another application here. It says goodbye, Fedora. Mm. 
And it's just another application exposed out of the same snap. And the point for this is that you can actually have multiple applications, services, you know, background stuff, uh, desktop applications, command line tools in a single package. So you can actually do this. And every user can choose per snap the you know, stability level, the risk level they, they want to follow. You can also have like major releases, so maybe there's like a 1.x release with, which is stable and 2.x which is stable, but people actually have to choose to go from one to the other. So if every, every developer who makes a snap gets to essentially design how people can consume the snap as a user. And, and this, is, this is what I was mentioning earlier about um, channels and tracks and things like that. So like a developer can choose how they want to structure the delivery of the software and how people move forward and stuff like that. So as a simple example, that's, I'm, I'm done typing, so just going to uh, quickly stand up. As a simple example, this is the Skype Snap, which is published by Microsoft. And you know, Snap has, uh, sorry, Skype has this insider thing, which is the Microsoft term for you know, beta program. future be beta, whatever. So you can actually see that I can install Skype from either the stable channel or from the insider channel. So insider is like a, you know, a separate track, so I can like, pick the latest and greatest insider, which is kind of stable, or you know, even follow Edge. And it's essentially up to the developer to figure out how to shape this space in a way that is meaningful to the project. So this is like modularity, but you know, kind of delivered per application, per package. Well, it's, it's basically you know, per application, rather than uh, it's, it's modularity in th is the concept itself is actually more or less in the snap world and like modu how modularity aims to offer um, with the snaps you can actually do modules for any type of application rather than having a multiple different technologies to try to achieve that like instead of having to have different docker thingies and different flat pack thingies and stuff like that where you have piecemeal integrations across the board the idea is that you can have a coherent and consistent integration with your host system and the application environment um, in a way that is flexible and meaningful and relatively easy to audit and maintain um, over time and across the server and clouds and IOT and desktop you know so it's just one solution that seems to fit all the places very well can you switch back to the slides? <laughs> sure. Um. Yeah. So, um, so it, anyone have any questions? So, uh, this slide is just Q and A. So now you know you can just feel f just ask us questions. But if you switch to the next slide, there's going to be some links if you want to take photos and yeah. just go there later. Yep. Uh, no, you you don't have to take photos because I will actually export these slides and put them up on the Flock 2018 page whenever it shows up. Um, but if you want, yeah, th there's actually a couple of other tools. I'll probably add the links later. But like these two are the ones that Ziga used for this particular demo. Um, there's a couple of others that I wrote as well for like how to yeah. make these things. So, so yeah. <coughs> wow. Stop being ashy, microphone. So I was told that if we actually speak, we don't have to speak. At the, we cannot speak at the same time, or we get ashy. And if we don't want to speak, we can just mute this. But okay. uh, uh, just as a as a quick. Explanation. This is the the source, the entire source for the Fedora 29 base snap. It's done under the umbrella of the server working group, I think. Uh, so we have the permission to call it Fedora. Um, we're gonna hand it off to the infrastructure team essentially when we stop tweaking the way it's built. And I think we're feeling comfortable. We need to have a conversation, you know, about we want to hand it off. This is how it looks like. Where do we plug it every time there's a compose? And the hello Fedora um, program is just a there's a make file, there's a C file. Uh, there's a license, and you can build it yourself. You can try it on your machines. So all of these things you can essentially easily try on your machines, either by following the demo instructions, which lets you just install the Fedora 29 snaps straight from the store, or by building it on your own machine and installing it by, you know, directly. And note that the hope is that once we get to Snapcraft, um, you can just take regular Fedora packages. No modifications, no need to rebuild them all over the place to change like namespaces or whatnot. We can use them as pristine inputs to actually put together um, uh, snaps of application services and stuff like that. So, unlike in the flat pack model, you know, th it's fine for you know how they're doing it for their model. But unlike the flat pack model, actually, we can just use the packages as they are because we preserve full FHS inside, and we use uh, what is it, bind mounts? And we use the mount namespace to actually yeah, put the a, mount namespaces you know. with SquashFS overlays and stuff yeah. like that. No and overlays actually. But well, I mean, yeah. the overlay is in not not overlay yeah. FS specifically because there's whole host of problems there. <laughs> so the Fedora 29 step is actually just a bunch of uh, RPMs in packed. So we have like a f the, the file system package, some LAN packs, uh, like bash, core utils, things like that. Just like we don't have to re actually rebuild them. It's just like the whole thing takes like, you know, 10 seconds to build.
I mean, it only takes 10 seconds because you split up all the steps. Uh, no, if you put all the steps in one, it's like four and a half seconds. So, I'm the RPM guy, so I have to ask how our updates are going to work. So, first, how do you how do you get updates on your base system, and and do you have tooling basically to monitor the packages you've put in there to get this base updated? And also, how are users uh, going to see updates, and are there automatic updates for the uh, snap s snaps themselves? The questions. So the question is, how does updates work? How both on the back end, how do you know where we have to rebuild something, and how do users get it? So on the back end, uh, technically we can just build it. For instance, every day or every time there's something urgent, like a CV triggers a rebuild, we can look at the manifest of things that are actually in it, and if it changed, we can say, okay, that's fine. We now can publish it. So essentially, every time you build it, you get a squash of a file, a single file, and they can just say, okay, I'm fine. I'm going to upload this to the Edge channel um, in the store. And after some QA, you can go to beta, to candidate, and to stable. And then whichever channel you're subscribed to as a user, you'll just get the update. So you don't have to actually you know, do anything about it. Just everything updates automatically. Updates are done by default, uh, I think, twice a day. So twice a day, every machine just, or once a day, I forgot, just goes to the store and asks, you know, well, is there anything to update to? And just gets pulled in. And for some of the updates, they are applied live, so things like, well, it's complicated, but the essence is that um, if you have like a service, Apache, for instance, and there's an update, it just gets restarted, poof, it's up to date, you're actually running the new version. If it's like Firefox, you will actually get a prompt, you have to restart it, and once you close it, all the processes go away, then the switch happens and you actually get the new one. So for the from the user's point of view, there is no off switch, which is sometimes controversial, but they mean it means they actually are updating all the time. They can only pick the schedule when they are on update. They can de defer it for like three months, but they cannot turn it off. So everyone's going to update. Well, don't forget the, about the, the oh yes, and if you're on a matter connection, like you have a modem, you're roaming, you don't want to pull them in right now. You can. This is actually integration with that, so we're you know you're just going to be postponed while you're on this connection. This is also a preference. So there's a lot of things you can tweak, but the default is you just update all the time. Um, and it's transparent. And also Delta updates. So this is actually pretty nice. You know, if, if, if there's a typo, but it's essential, well, it's a very, very, very small update. So one of the things actually is going to come out of this is we're going to have to figure out, well, building is easy. Well, publishing is interesting because do we publish it to stable? Is there going to be QA involved? We don't have answers for that yet. This is just us stating there's some possibilities we can explore. But we don't have a process for this yet. I can tell you how this works in Ubuntu. Over time, there's a new core snap, which essentially is a, a, like a small truth with Ubuntu. Uh, it goes through a huge QA phase, which lasts around a week at least of busy work. Like tons of tons of things happen during that time. And this is only after it has been in candidate for weeks, I think. So there's a you know, it t there's a always like a one month lag, maybe, unless it's super urgent, we do a very quick release with a very targeted update. But there's a lot of QA involved. Uh, the reason for this is, again, because this actually goes to people, and they are always going to get it. And there's no distributor in between. So if we ship something broken, well, we break everyone who has it. So the good thing is we can also unbreak it. So <laughs> the, it's one really interesting thing. Like I w I've been doing packaging in the past, and it was always like, yeah, you know, well, it's broken. We're going to fix it in the next package. That's fine. But also we have some devices which do not have classic packages. There's no dpackage. There's no apt on the system. The only thing that is on the system is SnapD, and, and everything is a snap. So we had some gray hair and some very interesting technologies that let us unbreak the world in case we ship something that doesn't work at all. So people can still recover these things. And one of the things we did use a couple of times as we were just figuring out how the whole thing works is that because the store has binaries that are, you know, there's revision one when I upload it, there's revision two when I upload it, and I say, okay, revision one is stable, people get revision one. And I say revision two is stable, and people get revision two, and oh my god, it's broken. I don't have to build revision three. I can just say, you know, revision one is stable. So you just go to revision one. These are no like version, you have to increment them. This is like a branch you follow. This is a stream of things you get. They have a version as a name for you to look at. So it's, you know, you can familiarize, okay, this is this version of the application, but essentially it's a channel you're, uh, you're subscribed to. So you can go back to the one you had just a moment ago and, you know, the devices stop 
catching on fire in the field. I'm happy that we have questions. Yeah, but the the problem with that is, of course, you know, I assume you've got config files sitting in a user's home directory. So, you know, you've, your stable's been version 2. The user's config files have all been rewritten. They You then declare stable being version 1, and it can't read all the version 2 config files, and you've broken it even more. That's such a fantastic question. Thank you. So we actually solved that in a very nice way. So what we do, so what we can do this from our end. We can say, oh my god, we broke the world. We can say, go back to revision 1. If a user sees that it's broken for me, I don't like it for whatever reason, I can just say snap revert Firefox and bam, and on the rest version I was running, including the data I had. So if there was like an incompatible schema change or the data just got lost because there was a typo and it removed everything, SnapD actually manages the application data. So it knows where it is, it cannot be anywhere else, it cannot just write all over the system. We can actually take a snapshot of that data before we do the refresh. So we actually have something to go back to. So in this case where you know someone ships a uh, broken update to a photo application and eats all of your photos, well, well, we have some at least some attempts to solve that. You can also always kind of circumvent the system because if an application developer chooses to integrate with Snaps at this level, they can say, I want to have two data sets. I want to have the data set that just gets managed by SnapD entirely, and then maybe copying that, snapshotting that is going to be you know, costly. I also want to have a Snap, uh, sorry, a data set which is common across revisions. So maybe it's like, you know, me like the metadata for the photos gets snapshotted all the time, but the actual photos are not. So it would be like a separate data set. But at SnapD level, we have this distinction and applications can be written in a smart way to do the right thing. So we can both do it from our end, like pull in an, pull an, uh, an update and switch it to something that used to work before. And every user can choose to do it from themselves because not only you know it's their computer, they are in control of this, they have the data, you can go back. It also gives us a hint that didn't work for them. So this revision gets a like marked as bad on their machine and we get a ping in the store. So we can we don't have this working end to end yet, but essentially we're gonna be able to surface this to developers. Like a large percentage of your population is actually you know having issues with this release. So they will have some information. I'll take this one I'll just pass it my show. Um, so Anna, so I have questions about publishing. So how many snaps do you uh, make and uh, how do you publish them and can you sign them? And I'm guessing you are only making base snap and uh, you are letting the developers m uh, make their uh, own snaps on top of it. So are you releasing uh, uh, putting those uh, layered snaps on your in, uh, infrastructure or they can build their own? Okay, so a couple of things to unpack here. Uh, I'm going to go back because this is like recent memory. So uh, the developer gets to build the application and they can push it to the store for publishing. They can also set up a CI CD solution where essentially a developer, this works perfect for free software, just gets to point to a Git tree, which has all the things that are necessary to know how to build it. We build it in our infrastructure. It's, it's essentially like a click on GitHub and you, you get a snap out of this repository. Uh, and it's fully automatic but you can always build it on your infrastructure and upload it to the store. So you can completely control the build process. For publishing, we publish, like Canonical publishes a bunch of snaps for the products we make. We publish the base snaps with Ubuntu in it because we maintain, we, like, we have security promises for that. We have maintenance promises for that. We have a community of people who publish third-party software, but most of that is just like, you know, we published, like we made a snap, it works. You can see how this works in the store. Would you like to take it? And they say, usually say, oh, that's great, yes. And they just do it themselves now. So essentially the, on the first slide with all the icons, one of these snaps out of all the, all the set was done by someone working essentially more on snaps than the upstream project. Everything else is purely upstream people doing the releases, doing the QA, driving, figuring out how they want to use it, and them are publishing the whole thing to the store. So the store is essentially a place where you can publish, and we just to help to bootstrap the system, sometimes package software that is popular, and hand it over to the upstream developers to publish. Uh, do you have more questions? I have lost the context. So please repeat that. Yes, signatures, fantastic question. So SnapD, which I have not mentioned, has a fantastic security system about signatures. There's a root of trust. Um, everything is signed, permissions are signed. Like if I want to be a Snap, which has super deep system integration, like I'm a container runtime, which means I can do a lot of things, which probably allow me to break out of the sandbox. This is a fully signed document saying that this Snap ID has the, these permissions. It's fully signed all the way back to the store. So yes, everything is automatically signed by you as a developer when you build it. By the store, it gets cross-signed. It's, it's, there's all across the stack, yes.
All right, so I will take this question. So the answer is currently no, you cannot host your own store. Oh, yeah, yep, so. Repeat the question. Okay. Uh, you asked uh, if we can host our own store. Uh, the answer is, unfortunately, no. Not right now, or possibly ever. So I don't know. I can tell We're you still about fighting that. The, the, the idea. The idea is there's going to be one store, but you can host your own app. So you can have your own private view of the store. That like, let's like you deploy in an enterprise, you want to have your private snap, so you can both host them locally, physically on your premise that they never leaked on the internet, and you can also have a proxy, which essentially is like a proxy for all the machines that talk to this thing instead of the real store. So it's just all in your network. So you can do like really like offline like deployments and you can keep the snaps local, but essentially there's one store. So this thing is just like a filter on the real store. You can say, I'm a full filter. I just give you the file five snaps that I want in my enterprise and nothing else. It could be like an add-on, it could be like a filter. It's essentially, we don't want to have a world where there's a billion little repositories and all the users are tricked to sign up to that repository which will never, like, there was this fantastic case where somebody uploaded an application with a miner in it. So you run a game, but it's mining Bitcoin or whatever on your machine. What we did when this was identified is within a couple of minutes, we blocked this snap so no one could install it. We pulled it from the store. We removed the miner, re-uploaded it to the store, got in touch with the developer, and within a couple of hours, the whole planet was on a version without the miner. If this was a separate repository that this guy has set up, none of that would be possible. So. We have a you know we have a firm vision and design on why we have a single store. We have ways of deploying stores for enterprises, for companies, for even people. I mean, this like you could just deploy the proxy in your laptop if you want to. But there are reasons why we chose to do it. It's not like an, where it's Wild West and this PPA has a fancy game, but it also happens to ship Libc. Why? Well, people don't really understand why, but it ships it, and it has this fancy version number 999. So you're just going to update. Why? Well, because that's how the packaging system works. We want to avoid these problems because we, there's a ton of these things in the wild, in the, and it's just a design issue. It's not like we can whack them more. We have to make the system so that they cannot be done. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yes. Yes, but every device has to sign. Like, I want to talk to the proxy. You have to tell the device, please talk to this proxy. Uh, essentially, every, essentially, what this is, the proxy uh, is a mechanism in which you have a slice of it where you're hosting yourself, and it's a transparent overlay on top of the main snap store. That means that the ultimate root trust is the canonical store, uh, pun intended. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, well, the the root tr it's X509 based uh, root trust, not GPG trust. So it's based on the root CA that comes from the canonical store, and every cert is derived from that, yeah. and that's how SnapD trusts everything. Yeah. Um, there is no currently open source implementation of the proxy server, which is something that I'm fighting to have a version of, because that will make it easier for us to say in Fedora have a gateway for actually storing them and actually plugging it into Bodhi or some other release process to be able to do this correctly so as we push it forward. The store is huge and complicated. Like it's, it's a living project for, with a long past. So it's not like we don't want to, you know, it's both a product and it's both a complex s stack that doesn't really make sense to give to people. One thing that I think was going to happen very quickly, it's part of the other proxy work, is that essentially going to be able to have a snap in the main store, but to say, I want to host it here. So people actually go to the store and say, I want to install this snap. And instead of going to the CDN, which we give everyone for free, we can just go to the place you picked. So it's evolving. I mean, we're using it. People are saying, oh, I'd like to use it in this way, but it's not doable right now. And we talk to them, and, th and things improve. So the store has improved tremendously. The API is public. The API is documented. It's just also kind of not full because it's been improved tremendously, but there are still some crafty things in it because it's a it's been a legacy project in the past. And I think at, at some point we're gonna hit a moment where we're gonna feel this is the feature set we plan to have and this is okay. We're gonna say this is the stable API. I think people can just easily make another store. The thing that is tricky there is essentially SnapD has uh, a, a, you know, a, a certificate of trust. So, well, you can always rebuild SnapD to trust too, but then you get to figure out what federation means in this context. So. Maybe we'll get there eventually. It's just a process. That's why that's, this is simpler now. And I'm going to hand this to you because we've been waiting so long. Different question now. Uh, so can the proxy store blacklist some packages from the main store because of some policies, for example? Yes. Okay. So that's actually the, so that's one of the reasons why I kind of want to have an open the open source version of the proxy server because so for example, currently today, Canonical publishes a network manager snap. They publish it based on the Ubuntu packages for network manager. However, that does nobody any good 
if you are running that snap on a Fedora because it isn't compiled to support if config Red Hat. So without that capability, it is not able to read our configuration. So in our case, we would want to have our uh, Fedora-based systems go through our proxy first, detect our network manager snap, use it, which can read our configuration, but still provide all the same functionality and plug into the slot and override, essentially, the canonical snap. These are all good ideas. I mean, we're just like we have never attempted something like this before. We have the network manager snap specifically because SnapD has a double life on the desktop and the server and everywhere else, and as a core distribution, which is without any classic packages meant for embedded devices for IoT. So we have actually network managers. So we can have like a little box somewhere in the forest with a solar panel and an antenna, and you know you'd actually want to have it reliable. So. A kernel is a snap, the whole file system is a snap, all the applications are snaps. When something goes bad, it can roll back automatically. It's all super reliable and robust to the level which we could never do with the package. Because like all of these are squash squash file system. We don't unpack hundreds and thousands of files in the file system, we just mount them and pick the one we want to use. So it's atomic on all the levels that matter. So we have the netless because IoT. But you know, improvements welcome, really. It's the best example I could come up with on a short notice about a reason why we would want to be able to do that. But there's obviously other reasons, like policy reasons. Maybe you don't want people to install you know, weird games or stuff like that on, on the computers, or maybe you have approved vendors or whatnot. So uh, that question is something that actually, yeah, yes, I actually have the answer to this because I have talked to Gustavo, who is the tech lead and other things, uh, about this. Um, one of the things that we are working on for both GNOME, for, for SnapD first, because it's not yeah. quite in place yet, because SnapD now actually validates SPDX expressions as well as other conditions and assertions, we can actually add filters. That for part is already in place. Just the store part doesn't. Like yeah, the, the GNOME software doesn't do it, but yeah. SnapD can do. Well, SnapD has those. I was going to get to that, damn it. Uh, so the, uh, because SnapD has these facilities, the store side, is, you know, there, there's work on that ongoing to export this information. And now what we're also working on is getting the various desktop integration plugins to be able to respect that so that, for yep. example, in Fedora, it's very important that we present by default a view that doesn't include things that would uh, encumber yep. or otherwise, you know, uh, you know, be bad for people to deal with. So we want to be able to present a view that is consistent with Fedora's principles by default. If people want to choose to see other things, we can obviously give them the option of flipping it just like what happened with uh, third party. for, for third-party yep. repos for Fedora 28. So just to complement that, Snow, the store knows the license of everything. The SnapD knows and can parse and can analyze. And you can actually make a query. Give me like this, like can I, is this Snap free software? Can I install it? So the only thing that's missing today is a flip switch in GNOME software that just shows you a different list by default. But the whole backend work is done. Sure. So I think this is tricky because you're not actually shipping VLC. So oh. it's a legal question whether that's necessary or not. I'm not going to answer it. I'm just going to point out that this is not coming from the repository of Fedora. It is not shipped on the image. It is something they can. Ch it's like saying you c it's mad. It's bad to ship Firefox because you can go to a website with MPEG on it. It's users. The users are actually going to do the thing unless you start shipping snaps in the distribution. Well, then it's, then it's tricky. But yeah. it's the s mm -hmm. but it's the same situation with the third party repository well, toggle that you start when you run GNOME software for the first time. It asks you if you want to have this or not. Yeah, but the and if you do, you have the VLC the and. No, no. There's Spotify there. There's tons of stuff. No, no. The switch is essentially saying instead of looking just as the Fedora repository, look at anything that is there. The while it is true that that list is curated, it does include Chrome. And Chrome most definitely has patented technologies. So, you know, it's up, again, we're, the point is we want to make it so that by default, 
We're not presenting people with things that they're either uncomfortable with or don't want to see or are against Fedora's principles, but we want to be able to give the same level, uh, we want to give people the option of choosing if they want to deliberately ignore that with all the same warnings and whatnot that happens, you know, when, we, when the third party repo setup ha occurs. Um, Richard, I believe you had a yeah, question. Yeah, I mean, um, just to kind of follow up there, you know, in OpenSUSE, we do not have the third party toggle on GNOME software because, you know, it's, you know, for all of these reasons, it's it's legally unsound, at least in Europe. Um, in addition, I mean, the, the general principle from our lawyers is one of, if it's enabled by default, then we are responsible for the distribution of everything via that software source. So the coven, the whole single unified Snap Store, completely kills the idea of being anywhere near an automatic OpenSUSE installation because we can't trust a third party that we have no control over. So it, it, it's just legally unsound. We never could, even if you were doing everything wonderfully, you know, it's, it, we're the legal re person responsible, how, how could we trust you? Um, and that, that's something we really desperately need to look at because with Flatpak there's a story that we can live with, with App Images there's a story we can live with, and with... <laughs> Oh, uh, there's ours. Uh, yeah, but it's a story we can live with better than the, the snap one. Well, I mean, but because there's no story in app image, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah. So that's it, yeah. If you want widespread, you need to look at this. So in some cases, you can maybe make the analogy of. I'm an open I choose to install Steam, and therefore I, as a user, made the choice. It wasn't on by default, and now I can run all the proprietary stuff in Steam. Well, that's okay. I think that's like, we can definitely make it better. I mean, this is really, really useful feedback. We can definitely make it better, so maybe it could be installed by default, but give you a different view by default that you can control. That's fine. Uh, but there are always just ways to install it and let people use it because it's their choice, not the distribution at this point. I doubt you know, the distribution is legally encumbered because someone may install Steam and therefore install proprietary software, which also may be patented. So, I mean, I think there... We Hold on, but Steam is a gateway to a load of things that are definitely proprietary, so I don't get the point. So, if you ship Steam in the repository, and someone puts bad stuff in Steam, and Valve says we will not remove it. That's the exact situation that you would be if you shipped the Snap Store. Steam's an intermediary, so down, you know, d adding, uh, you know, have, have adding an app store. So you know, we don't install Steam by default. Choosing to add an app store of of, of a third party, and then fine, no problem. If we en enabled Steam by default, so Steam was automatically pulling stuff from the third party, which is basically I what you're advocating, you're okay. that, you know, then we're in legal trouble. That's the difference. Sure, I understand. You know, so, you know, Snap is a so I think we just need to have a conversation of what will be acceptable, because I think we have the means of figuring out how to make it happen. So, you know, for what it's worth, Sigmund, I think this, this is more or less the same conversation we have, you know, when it comes to Fedora. And so, well, right now, Obviously, activating the Snap integrations is actually the user's choice. It's not active by default. It's not shipped on any images. And so for us, the question is more or less this, basically the same kind of answer that you, know, you Richard, have for OpenSUSE with Steam. Basically, user has to choose to even install it in the first place. And at that point, they'll see the view. And then they'll get the question about which views they want to see. So I think from the Fedora perspective, at least how we're doing this now, um, we're, in, we're in the clear, um, but we do need to start having that conversation. I think it, it was actually great. I'm glad that you did bring that up, because it's not just me. <laughs> um, but uh, I definitely want to have a, 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 be a more conversation about that and less Ash involved. Yep. <laughs> check, check. So, I mean, definitely, this is really great feedback because um, we need this kind of feedback to know what is the blocker for you know, making this just available to users and make it pleasant and easy to use while staying legal, while staying, you know, in sync with the principles of a given medium. So I think this is all great. Any more questions? So when we were talking about the, the when, when some application breaks and I need to revert to some older version, so me as a user, 
can I return to any arbitrary older version or can I return just to the latest one? So that's actually a fantastic question. As you saw earlier in the demo, Zygmunt actually did that exactly. And you can actually speak, you, when you do the refresh, you can, he said refresh to a channel, but you can actually refresh to any revision that's installed or has been installed on your computer, yeah. barring barring certain restrictions that the developer has indicated that, say for example, there may be a blacklisted revision or something has been, um, there's a feature that we didn't talk about called epochs and stepped upgrade. If you have gone through a sufficient number of data migrations, yeah. the, the developer may have said that there's, n going backwards at this point is like a super bad idea, so I don't wanna let you do it. Um, there is a certain point, but generally speaking, I think most software haven't been using that particular restriction. So yep. uh, as a general rule, you can assume that you can go backwards and forwards with, provided that the data has been captured so that it can roll back and move forward the data migrations. And just to clarify one specific detail, but you can always go to any revision which is published in that channel. So, you know, like if you look at Snap Info MySQL, you're going to see lots of things you can go to, like all the major revisions, a bunch of like, you know, nightly builds from, from Master and, and some other things. You can always go to all of these. In addition, you can go to any revision that you had on your machine. Like SnapD, when you refresh this, your, uh, a Snap, it keeps up to three, it's, to it's a toggle now, so you can keep like up to one or up to 100. It keeps a set of revisions you have before along with their data, so you can go back in case something breaks. On like an IoT device, we also have the factory one we can go to always in case everything breaks. So we were always a way to, you know, to bootstrap the machine. So this means that as a user, you have a public set of things you can go to, which are just the, the published versions in some branches, plus the things you had before on your machine that you can still go back to because you have the data. As a developer, you can always go to any revision that is in the store, even if it's not published, because you can actually upload the revision and not publish it, and you just use it on your machines. This is one way in which people actually use snaps. They just you know, have their app, publish it to the store, well, publish, upload it to the store, it's private, and just use it on a fleet of machines, that's fine. Or even just copy the file around and install it there. But as a developer, you have access to anything you have uploaded. As a user, you have the access to the things that the developer chose to publish or the things you were on, which means the things you were on before because the developer chose to publish it. Uh, and can I have several revisions active at the same time for a snap? The answer to that yes. is actually yes, yes. because so Zygmunt, is, Zygmunt is very, very happy about this because he spent like two months working on making that possible. It's not me, it's Maciej from our team. So we have something which we call parallel installs. So I can say, it's like think about a web developer thinking and I'm going to do something on my laptop, but it's going to look like I'm like a, a server. Oh, it's that. Okay. So I can say like snap install MySQL underscore production, snap install MySQL underscore devel. I had just two, two, like I have the same snap installed twice under different name. So I can choose, like, it has separate data sets, obviously, that I can freely choose to move. Like I can keep production on like 5.x stable and choose to move devel to like 5.x like candidate or edge or six. I can essentially install a snap on my machine any number of times I want under different names. So it's going to be like, you know, the, the prefix is the same and you're going to have, you know, an identifier of the instance essentially. So this is modularity with parallel installability. Take that. Availability and parallel installability and you get to choose every single revision of every version of every track of every channel. And this is this is in master now. It's going to be roughly either th it's going to be available in the next release as an opt-in because it's a new feature, and it's going to have general availability perhaps in the following release, which is probably two months from now. Yeah, and so the plan is that the next release, because it includes some of the fixes that it, the some of the fixes that Zygmunt finally got merged uh, today. Uh, Probably in the next release, 235, whenever it gets tagged, um, he's not, he and I are going to work on actually bringing it into Fedora. So expect to see it as a Bodhi update sometime for all stable Fedora releases. And another thing that we're working on, or I'm working on because it's complicated and awful and hard, is actually bringing it also to Apple 7. So we want to also add this to Apple 7, and I've been gradually working on this for the past, I think, what, eight, nine months or so. Um, it's actually quite a lot of work done within the security stack in Fedora to make things really good and we've been working off of the assumption that like that stuff is available to us some of that stuff ha doesn't exist in EL7 and for a while that made it just not possible and as every rebase of RHEL 7 has occurred and CentOS 7 consequently uh, it has made it easier and easier to bring it and so we're like nearly to the point where I can actually start being comfortable with shipping it to Apple 7 itself although to be quite honest, you probably 
roughly the same cadence for releases that we do for Apple 7 that we do for Fedora itself because it's a it's an application that people don't generally integrate with and it also uh, is a gateway application for accessing other services and stuff that people will generally want to use. So I'm I generally do this on a monthly just because frankly most of the point releases are most of the point releases that they make are irrelevant to me because they're mostly because they're broken on Ubuntu and none of the breakages affect me. <laughs> so the point releases we make are because we have the very integrated QA pipeline. If something breaks we actually have to make a new release so that Either the test is corrected, or you know, something else happens that makes it fixed. So we, this is formally a point release, but typically it doesn't really mean anything in the applications in the whole QA around it. And also on the core devices, because it's the same thing that gets shipped to both desktop service and IoT devices. Some of the things that are shipped are actually only meaningful in an IoT context, where snaps run without anything else, and they have to manage the kernel, they have to manage the bootloader, and everything else. So some of the updates are actually you no. Know, yeah, you get the update, but it, there's nothing really changing for you because you're not using that part of the code. Which is part of the reason why you tend to only see me do snap update, snap the updates rel more or less monthly, maybe every two months, because sometimes eh, it doesn't work, and then fixing it, it takes a lot of effort and whatever. So uh, I I try to keep up as close with the sna with the snappy upstream maintenance, and like Zygmunt and I actually work very closely upstream a lot because like it's a big deal and we want to make sure everything is working as well as it can uh, to the best of our ability now if anyone's interested one of the, if you are interested and want to help us with making this better please get in touch with either one of us either me or Zygmunt and like we can help uh, we we have all kinds of things that you know we would love to have help on and just you know and we'll give you cookies and maybe you'll get to see like random awesome countries too maybe I don't know. Probably not. But, you know, there's at least good cookies. Yeah. Any other questions? OK. A last question, because I think we are already over time. Uh, so if I want to create, uh, if I want to create a snap, and um, it's not uh, currently packaged uh, in Federal, let's say, uh, but I want to use the existing RPMs for dependencies of the program, and then just compile the actual application is it possible so that is uh, literally the whole point of what we're trying to do yeah. because aside from being able to use fedora content fedora rpms for like the application themselves we also want to make it so like um yeah finally could you unlock the screen so that the we can go back to the slide with the dax <laughs> thank you and connect to the internet again really? yes really because you've disconnected for too long and okay so now there we go. So this this is sort of the point of this particular slide with the development stacks. Pre-built apps is only one of them. But the idea is all of these stacks, um, so I'm going to use some Snapcraft terminology here. So Snapcraft has a concept of parts and inputs and sources. And the idea is that these would be defined in the Fedora context to use the Fedora framework stacks, app, uh, libraries, language things, and so on. And so like, for example, let's talk about Python, because that's a very common thing. You know, maybe you want to use Python 3.7. It's not available anywhere else. Nobody else has it yet. Or Python 3.8, because it's got an alpha in the rawhide or whatever. And you want to build an application that uses that. So you, you, you choose a Fedora base that includes that Python. You install that Python. You then tell it to pull in all the dependencies that you want, or Python modules and whatnot. Then you just do the pip thing inside, or the, or the pi build, or whatever. Whatever mechanism you use to pip install is the files. Here and the packages are here. So, so you can do whatever you want there. Yeah, no, it, it doesn't matter. Oh, that yeah. Yeah, yeah. Abs yeah so so essentially, the point is that this is not. That doesn't mean you have to have a Python package. It means it's the Python language with its ecosystem. Every pre-built RPM is here, so we can pick WebKit. And if this is a community that chooses to use a certain way to deploy and install and manage software like pip, or whatever is here, gems, or whatever is here, cargo, cargo. or yeah, I don't that know, Rust, that one's and these things are the native thing for that community. So essentially, when there's a community making, for instance, Electron applications, the native thing for them is some version of Electron Builder, I suspect. And we haven't invented a new way and said, this is better, you have to learn this now. We actually went to them and said, Electron Builder is great. And now it actually, when you make out of the Electron Builder, you get a snap. So for them, it's the same thing they're used to. Ex so this is exactly why all these icons are here. This is the same thing people are using in these communities. And this is the entire distribution as it's 
you know, as its muscle, so he can take all the good stuff, including pulling the security fixes. So one thing I want to highlight, because this is super cool and it's relatively unknown, if I'm a developer and I pull in as a pre-built application just some packages, right, and there's a CVE, I get an notification that my, my snap may be vulnerable to the CVE, and there are instructions on how to rebuild my snap, there are instructions what to do to check, there's more information about CV, it's just sent to the developer, because we don't know it's actually used by the snap, so we're going to tell, tell it in public, but the whole pipeline of security updates goes really nicely, because I can say, okay, I may be vulnerable, I'm just going to hit this button to rebuild, I'm going to publish it, and people are going to get it with a Delta update. And when it comes to, for the Fedora perspective, the idea was that we'd integrate with things like our update info publishing and Bodhi and whatnot, and we could, since we know what the content is inside, and we have an introspector, which I already wrote, for uh, uh, identifying RPMs and what's going on inside, we can actually just go and see, okay, this version is matched to this update info, say, this package is matched to this update info, saying this NVR is newer, and this one fixes this CVE, this one's older than that, maybe there's something that's affected. So, like, we want to introduce that kind of pipeline also for Fedora, and hopefully we can actually do some interesting things for uh, applications that are published by Fedora and within the release engineering pipeline to make things a little bit better for things that people want to publish under the Fedora organization. But for you as an individual developer, you know, we have, we, we have some resources for that kind of stuff. And the other important thing is this is all mix and match. So that means that you could have some stuff that is pre-built RPMs, some stuff that uses PIP, some stuff that uses gems, some stuff that uses fuck all who knows what uses Go, and then all those other things. And it, will, uh, it has introspectors and part managers for all of those things to be able to tell you whether or not you might have to do something. As an interesting observation, like uh, there was a session here on this course, like this course is a nicer thing than a mailing list, obviously, and it may be useful to use. So if you go to the forum at snapcraft.io, that is the, the discourse instance, obviously, and all of that is a snap. The whole discourse is a snap, the database is a snap, all of that thing is running from a snap. So you can essentially, it's not like I have to have like my application, like Python dash something dash develop, but also like, you know, the, it's not like a huge split. It's, you can put all of these things in a single package, if that's what, the, what, what, what makes sense to your system. Well, if you wanted to build something that's super weird and complicated, you want to put Koji as a snap. That would involve pulling in Python stuff, that would involve pulling in C and C++ stuff, some pre-built applications. Maybe you're going to wind up having some application services like database stuff, you're going to have, you know, a web server thing, and then, so all those things together would wind up being in a snap, and it would... Or if you choose to, for whatever reason, you can actually make multiple snaps and make connections between them to make, like, okay, I, all of these things I, I, I already maintain have Python, so I'm just going to have my own Python snap, I'm going to connect it to all of these, so I don't have to have... A, another copy of Python, and B, I can actually ship an update to this my, my version of Python across my fleet of snaps, and hey, they update. So there's w there are ways to mix and match you know, how much you want to have in one snap and how much you want to share among your snaps. It's really interesting because it's not among the planet, so if you make a Python snap, you're not promising a support for the planet. It's just your, pi your snaps that can actually use it. Everyone can install it, but they cannot refer to it. So they cannot, like, you're not going to be on the hook just because you made some snap with some files in it, and then someone actually uses it in some way you don't know about, but then you change it and you broke the other guy. So this is impossible in the snap world, because essentially you can only break yourself, which you always could by shipping a broken snap you have. If you break your users, it's all your fault. <laughs> okay. But thank you for coming. <laughs>